and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. One of the biggest in the United States. Spreads out in all four directions like a broad loom rug. To the south and west, it's the downtown business district. To the east, the industrial area. Los Angeles, California. It's pretty much like your town. This is a Spanish priest, one of the city's founders. It's changed a lot since then. It's got high tension wires bringing in the power and bus lines to get you where you're going. It's got railroads and freight yards. Churches. Any kind you want. Public parks and lakes. It's got a police department and a city hall. This is where I work. I'm a cop. Saturday, August 8th, we were working the day watch out of Juvenile Division. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss is Captain Powers. My name's Friday. We'd gotten a call from a worried mother who reported her four-year-old twin girls missing. Hours had passed since we'd gotten the initial report. The children had failed to turn up. We had to find them. I told you all that on the phone. Have you found them yet? We've checked out the names that you gave us, Miss Carston. Everyone who knows your little girls, the kids they play with, the neighbors, the storekeepers in the area. We haven't any word yet, but we're still checking. Oh, no, Dick. Somebody's got to have seen them. Tilly and Joan couldn't have wandered off that far. They're only four years old. I don't think it's as bad as it might seem to you, ma'am. Children have been missing a lot longer than your two little girls, and they've turned up all right. Try to relax if you can, Miss Carston. Well, why hasn't somebody seen them? They wandered off from us in the park, but it's only three blocks from the house. Why hasn't somebody seen them? It's dark out. God knows what could happen to them at night. Is there anything we can get for you, Miss Carson? No. No, I'll be all right. Did you see my husband? Yes, ma'am, we did. He's over at the park with the other officers. I think it's just a matter of time, ma'am. We've got three teams of men working on it with us. We've gotten out a broadcast on your girls. Did you talk to the Stanleys down the street and the Petersons? Yes, we did. We checked out all the names that you gave us. There is one thing we want to ask you about. What's that, Sergeant? About the exact spot in the park where you had your picnic this afternoon, where the girls wandered off. Well, it's exactly where I pointed it out to the other officers. By the Eucalyptus Grove, right off 7th Avenue. It's just about 2.30 this afternoon. We finished lunch. My husband was taking a nap. I was reading. I saw the girls playing tag over by the trees. I looked up in a few minutes and they were gone. It's just like I told the other officers. Then you're sure about that location? Of course I'm sure. Why should I lie to you? I want you to find the girls. They're just babies. You can see there's a picture over there. They're only four years old. Yes, ma'am. We're doing everything we can. I know. I know. You want me to get that for you, Miss Carston? Would you please? Yes, ma'am. Anything? No, nothing. You? One step last time? Yeah, sure. Excuse me. Ralph and I checked with the guy who runs an ice cream wagon. He works the area in the park where the kids disappeared. You know, what did he tell you? He saw a couple little girls about a half a mile from that eucalyptus grove about 3 o'clock this afternoon. They were with a man. Who? Yeah. He saw the man put the kids in the truck and drove away with them. 8 p.m. Together with John Lewis, Frank and I left the Carston home. We didn't tell the mother about the latest report. Until it was positively confirmed, we felt that telling her would serve no purpose other than to cause her needless worry. We 
drove over to the park to talk with the ice cream vendor, a Mr. George Comanches. He pointed out the area where he'd spotted the children in the company of an unidentified man. It was right over there, officers. This big guy, a mustache. He had the little girls, one on each hand. He was walking them out of that clump of trees over there. You think you can describe the man for us, Mr. Comanches? I didn't look that close. I thought he was the father. The kids were sniffling, you know, maybe like they'd been crying. Better check the ground over by those trees, huh, Lewis? Yeah. Stan, Ralph. Didn't you notice anything at all about this man, Mr. Comanches? I mean, except his mustache? Well, a big man, big shoulders, work shoes, tan shirt, tan pants. How about the color of his hair? Some kind of distinguishing marks, maybe? No, I don't know. I thought he was the father. The kids were sniffling, the little girl. Was anything wrong? It didn't look like it. How about the man's truck? Did you notice that? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. How about the license number? You notice that? No, sir. Maybe I should have. I didn't. Joe. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, Lewis. Stan found this over in the bushes by the tree there. Yeah. Little girl's dress. Eight twenty-eight p.m. The area where the torn clothing was found was roped off and checked for fingerprints and other physical evidence. None was found. Homicide division was notified and joined in the investigation. The dress was taken down to Lee Jones at the crime lab for examination. Then it was shown to the father of the missing children, Frank Karsten. He definitely identified it. The search for the four-year-old twins was intensified. An emergency spot check was made of all known and registered sex offenders. We drove back to the city hall and we went to the stats office. of names, the stats office came up with one that might possibly tie in. He was listed as George Harris Lytell Gramberg. His address was at the south end of 7th Avenue, close by the park area where the Karsten twins had disappeared. Gramberg was described as tall, well-built, dark hair with a mustache. We found him at his work, a small bar out in the Wilshire district. He played the Hammond organ. Yes, that's right. I live on 7th Avenue, right across the street from the park. What's the matter this time? Missing juveniles. Can you tell us what you did today, starting at noon, Granberg? I don't know if I can or not. I don't keep a daily log, you know. They didn't tell me I had to do that. Just tell us where you were between noon and six tonight. That's all we want to know. Well, that's quite a bit, don't you think? Suppose I told you I was playing canasta with a maiden aunt. Would that shock you? Well, you look, mister, we're not in the mood for smart answers. You just tell us where you were, that's all. I don't know why you always have to bother me every time something happens. You made your own reputation. We didn't. But what about it? I left my apartment about 11.30 this morning. I went down to the Union Hall and paid my dues. Had lunch with some friends at the Blue Pigeon out on Wilcox, and then we went on tour of one of the studios, all right? Will your friends confirm that story for you? Well, no, they won't. They left town tonight, took the 815 train to San Francisco. Well, what about it, Granberg? Who is going to vouch for your story? I already told you, my friends have left town. You can check with the guard at the movie studio if you want. We had a pass, time punched in, time punched out. It's all there. You want to call and check that studio, Frank? I don't mean to be rude, Sergeant, but I always did feel that registration business was unfair. Is that so? Yes, yeah, grossly unfair. Well, how do you suggest we keep track of you? Well, why do I have to be kept track of anyway? You know as well as I do, your record. Oh, it was all a lie. I hardly even touched that kid. I paid my time anyway. Why can't you give me a break? Every time something happens to a kid, I get a cop on my neck. Were you in the 7th Avenue Park at any time today, Granberg? What? I said, were you in the 7th Avenue Park at any time today? Matter of fact, I was, yes. I took a walk there. What time was that? I don't know. I left my friends after lunch. I came home to freshen up about 1.30, I guess. I was in the park about 1.45, 2 o'clock. Only stayed a few minutes. When'd you leave? About 2.15. You went from the park to meet your friends at the studio, did you? Exactly right, yes. Did you see two dark-haired little girls while you were in that park? No, I didn't see anybody. I was by myself. You sure of that, are you? Of course I'm sure. Even if I did see them, it wouldn't mean anything. I don't molest kids. I don't get along with them, that's all. But I wouldn't hurt a little kid. I never could. No one says you have. I know that, but I just want you to know how I feel. Maybe I don't get along with kids, but I couldn't hurt them. Little girls especially. I like kids, really. Yeah. 
Jacob. Yeah. See you in a minute. Yeah. Did you talk to the studio? Yeah, I checked with the guard. What do you have to say? Granberg was there from 2.30 to 4.30. Yeah. His alibi is good. Ten fifty-five p.m. The four-year-old Karsten girls were still missing. A special detail of men from homicide had been assigned to a general canvas of the stores and homes in the park area. All the residents were questioned. No one had seen the children. Eleven twenty p.m. We stopped to call the office. Hello, Lieutenant Hartgrove. This Friday. No, we just talked with him. He's with her. Yeah. They did, huh? When? Yes, sir. Right. We'll get right over. Well, looks like the waiting's over. What do you mean? Office just got a call from Valley Division a few minutes ago. Yeah. The little girls, they've been found. PM. As soon as we got the word that the four-year-old Karsten twins had been found, Frank and I drove back to the office where Inspector Miller filled us in. A few minutes past 11 p.m., a motorist out in the valley spotted two small girls walking hand in hand along a deserted side road off Ventura Boulevard. Their clothing was dirty and torn. They were alone. The motorist picked them up and took them to the Valley Division station where the girls were identified. We sent out a partial cancellation on the APB. The twin girls were taken to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital where they were treated for cuts and bruises. Then they were returned to their home. The doctor reported that both girls had been molested. The search for the abductor went on. Late the next day, Frank and I, together with a policewoman, drove out to the Karsten home to talk to the twins. We had no luck at all. They were still shaken up from the excitement and the shock of their experience. It was the same thing this morning when I tried to question them. They just don't want to talk about it. Oh, it must have been horrible for them. Did they tell you anything at all, Mrs. Carson? Well, Joan just refuses to talk about it. She says the man was big. That's all I could get out of her. Until he seems a little more willing to talk, though. She's always been a little bit more forward than Joan ever since they were babies. I see. Could she add anything at all to what your other little girl told you about the man? She told her father the man had a mustache. Now, that probably impressed her because my husband wears one, too. I'm pretty certain she's right about that. I can usually tell when she's making things up. Mm -hmm. Now, how about the way the man was dressed, his clothes? No, they didn't mention anything in particular. Until he said the man was dirty. She said that two or three times. She kept on saying it, dirty, dirty clothes. Now, she might have meant the man had work clothes on. She has so many expressions, I don't know. How'd the man get your little girls under the truck? Did he offer them candy or something like that? Until he said something about a kitten. The man had a little kitten he was going to give to them. Oh, dear, if I've told them that once, I've told them a thousand times. Stay away from strangers. Don't go with them. Yes, ma'am. Did they tell you anything else at all about the man's description? Well, till he said the man was big. Oh, I don't know if you could count on that, though. Everybody looks big to her. I talked to her an hour, but she just kept repeating the same story. The man made them cry, tore their dresses, and, and hurt them. Oh, it must have been just horrible for them. Yes, ma'am. Did they tell you anything at all about the truck this man was driving? Maybe the color, something like that? Well, Tilly called it a big car. A funny big car. She said it was red, with red pictures all over it. Can't put much faith in that, though. Why not, ma'am? <laughs> Everything's red to Tilly now. Everything has red pictures on it. Just a face she's going through. A few weeks ago, it was blue. Everything was blue to her. Now it's red. Everything's red. I see. You think they might be able to tell you a little more in a day or so, maybe after they've quieted down? Well, I don't know. I certainly hope so. Thank God it's all over. They're home safe. That's all that counts. No, ma'am, I'm afraid there's more to it than that. What? The man that did it's still free. Monday, August 10th. The search for the suspect went on. All of us, the men from juvenile and homicide divisions, were pretty much feeling our way in the dark. Repeated questioning of residents living in the area where the abduction took place netted us nothing. Our two star witnesses, the four-year-old twins, were able to contribute very little. We stayed on it. Another three days of pounding the pavement, knocking on doors, and asking stock questions led us nowhere. 
As in most cases like this one, the criminal employed the distinct advantage of having victims who were unable because of shock to clearly identify him. Saturday, August 15th. In the late afternoon, we got a call from a Bernice Hopper, a real estate agent in the West Hollywood area. 4.15 p.m., Frank and I drove out to interview her. Excuse me, officers, I've just got to find that listing book first. Go right ahead, Miss Hopper. It's just got to be here someplace. It was only yesterday morning, I remember distinctly. I... There, now. I can start to do business again. Yes, ma'am. Well, I don't know if this is going to help you any in your case, officers, but I certainly think something should be done about it. Flagrant is the only word I can think of, just flagrant. Would you like to tell us about it? Well, I saw him yesterday for one thing. You see, I was coming back from lunch about 2.30 in the afternoon. Fridays, I always have a late lunch. I see. I was just passing the corner two blocks from the grammar school right up above on Prospect Avenue, and I saw this truck parked and this truck driver leaning out of the window talking to some children. Just tots, little tots. Yes, ma'am. What happened? Well, what happened is not so much that. It's just the way this truck driver was talking to these children. I must have been at least 20 feet from them, and even I could hear. What was that? Well, his language, just filthy. I couldn't understand it. A grown man talking to little tots like that. Every kind of filth, every obscene word you could think of. Was there any point in the way he was talking to the children, Miss Harper? I mean, was he mad at them? Did he seem sober? What was it? It was filth, that's all I know, officer. Some of the children didn't like it, and they told him. That only made him do it all the more. I really think you ought to check up on him. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us anything else about it? Oh, would you excuse me a moment? Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. Bernice Harper, real estate. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, Mr. Tomlinson, I remember. The house out on Norwich, wasn't it? Well, no. As a matter of fact, I sold it Monday. It's just like I told you things go so fast. Well, of course, if you'd had a substantial down payment to make at the time... I am sorry. There wasn't anything I could do. Yes. Well, I'm sorry, too. Well, thank you for calling. If anything turns up, may I give you a ring? Mm-hmm. No, I have the number out. All right, sir, thank you very much, and I am sorry. Right. Goodbye. Oh, my. Everybody wants something for nothing. They want houses, but they don't show their money. Poor kids, though. Saw a house out on Norwich, thought the down payment was too high. Now they've got the money, and the house is sold. Yes, ma'am. Now, where was I? About the truck driver you saw, Miss Hopper. Oh, yes. Well, after hearing that talk of his, I just copied down the license number of the truck. Got it right here in my desk. How about the truck driver, Miss Hopper? Did you get a good look at him? I certainly did, the way he acted with those children. Anything unusual about his appearance? No, nothing besides his foul mouth. He was dark, heavy set, and he had a mustache. Ties in. One more thing, the truck he was driving. Yes, ma'am. There were pictures painted on the side. Circus animals, I think. Did you happen to notice the color? Oh, yes, it was red. Even the pictures were red. <laughs> Four forty-five p.m. We took the license number of the truck which Bernice Hopper had given us and drove back to the office to check it through DMV. We found the truck was registered to a commercial baking firm in the south end of town. Through their personnel department and their dispatcher's office, we got the name and address of the employee who was driving the truck the same day Bernice Hopper had spotted the driver talking to the school children. His name was Lester Z. Wiley. We checked a little further and found that he was driving the same truck the day the Karsten twins were abducted. We called into R and I. Well, he had no criminal record. Oh, sure is stupid of me. I didn't even think of asking you if you wanted any of this. No thanks, Wiley. We'd just like to have you tell us why you use that kind of language in front of school children. Nothing to explain. A bunch of those kids were hanging around the truck. I thought maybe they wanted to get in and grab some of the cakes and stuff. I read them off. That's all. Well, that still doesn't explain the filthy language, Wiley. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't feeling good that day. Might let a few cuss words slip. I didn't mean anything by it. I like kids. You usually make deliveries up around the school area, Wiley? Oh, once in a while. Yeah, I get around quite a bit. That's not what they tell us down where you work. Hmm? You had no business in the neighborhood of that school. Your delivery route's in the other end of town. So I can't drive where I want. I get the deliveries made. What are they squawking about? I'd like to know what you were doing up in that neighborhood. I was on my lunch hour. I drove up to see a friend. I got a friend living near the school. What's the matter, anyway? Don't you think you've had enough of that? Look. You're not telling me what I have to do in my house. This is my house. If I want a glass of wine, I have it. You're not telling me what to do. 
All right, Wiley, take it easy. Take it easy, nothing. I've talked to you two guys long enough. There's the door. You're not coming in here telling me what to do. You better get your coat. We'll talk downtown. We're not talking any place. Now get out. Get out of this house right away. Are you afraid your story's not going to hold up? I don't know what you're talking about. You're trying to frame me. Don't you think I know that? Now, that doesn't make much sense, does it? Why should we want to frame you? I know what you're getting at. I know just what you're getting at. Those two little girls last week, you're going to say I took them. You're going to say I did things to them. Well, I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with it. Didn't you? No, I didn't. Look, I'm sorry, huh? Why don't you sit down? I didn't mean what I said. I, I guess I just got nervous. Sure, Wiley, we understand. Why don't you let me get you a couple of glasses? Have some of this wine. Warms you up. It's good. No, that's all right, Wiley. We'd just like to have you straighten us out on a couple of things. Yeah? Where were you between 12 noon and 11 p.m. last Saturday? That's the day that somebody picked up those two little girls, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Wiley. I don't know. I was making deliveries like I always do. Up to 11 o'clock at night? I was a little late, yeah. Nothing unusual, though. That's so. Uh-huh. Another working day, that's all. Hey, it's good wine. I might have been near the park where those two kids were. Doesn't mean anything, though. I get around quite a bit. I got a lot of deliveries to make. How about it, Wiley? Huh? Did you grab those two little girls? Oh, look at that. I don't have any more wine. I'm gonna go get another bottle. You've had enough of that. Go! Get out. You all right, Frank? Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out of my house! Now, how about it, Wiley? Oh, what's the use? It's no good at all. All right, you want to tell us about it? I didn't mean it, that's all. I didn't mean it. <laughs> Just that once in a while something goes wrong with me. I like kids. I like them too much, I guess. I, I didn't mean to hurt them. You ready to go now? Anything you say. I thought I had it with me when I grabbed the kids. What? I thought it was in my coat pocket. I'm glad I lost it. Glad you lost what? My pocket knife. I was going to kill him. December 10th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect waived his rights to a preliminary hearing, and at his arraignment in Superior Court, he entered a plea of guilty to kidnapping one count and child molesting one count. Child molesting is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of from one year to life. Kidnapping is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one, nor more than 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> 